Today's khutbah is dedicated to a number of ayat that belong to Surah Al-Najm, a very unique surah of the Quran. The surah begins by Allah describing the event of revelation itself. You guys, many of you are familiar that the first revelation to the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned in Iqra' Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq. That's much later on in the order of the Quran. But Allah describes the event, what happened then. Like all we have in, in Surah Iqra' and Surah Al-Alaq is actually the, the quote from the angel Jibreel from Allah Azza wa Jal, word for word. That's the words that were said. But here in Surah Al-Najm, what you have is what was going on, Allah describing the scene itself. What, how did revelation come to the Prophet ﷺ? What was the experience like of seeing the angel Jibreel? And it then also describes the journey later on in his life that the Prophet ﷺ took along with Jibreel ﷺ. So there's a number of things that are mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al-Najm. But then the surah actually transitions and talks about us. It talks about humanity, it talks about people. And it talks about the, the struggles people have to try to, to accept the call of the Prophet ﷺ. Now when we think of accepting the call of the Prophet ﷺ, we usually think of someone just taking their shahada, accepting Allah is one, accepting Muhammad is his messenger وسلم, it's as simple as that. But there are other dimensions of accepting Islam. There are other there are changes Allah wants to bring inside of a person. And these are some of the changes that Allah highlights that people are reluctant to bring into their life. And that's where the surah is almost towards an end. What are some changes Allah expects from people? This great revelation came to bring about a change. To bring about a change inside of me and inside of you. And part, some of those changes are very, very hard to make. They're not easy changes because we're comfortable in one place and we don't want to move from that place to another place, right? So Allah will describe people now in these ayat that have a hard time changing. And I wanted to share this khutbah with you because you and I often can find ourselves in that place. We recognize what is wrong. We recognize what we need to fix. And we're having a hard time changing ourselves. Or we find ourselves disappointing not anybody else, but even ourselves over and over again and not finding the way out from that cycle. So Allah Azza wa says, أَفَرَأَيْتَ الَّذِي تَوَلَّى Have you seen somebody who turned away? The Prophet is being told to take note of somebody who doesn't listen to his message. He invites him by the most powerful word ever given, from the most compelling source and the most authenticated source ever, ever given, Allah, and from, with the most you know, uh, uh, authentic person, credible person ever, Rasulullah himself sallallahu alayhi wa and yet somebody turns away. What could be going on in their head? You know, when, when somebody doesn't listen to a message, there could be two things wrong. It could be there's something wrong with the message. Or maybe there's something wrong with how it was delivered. And it wasn't very convincing and you're not convinced. But the other could also be that maybe there's something wrong with the person giving it. And you're like, I don't want to listen to this person. They have nothing good to offer me. Or I don't trust them. Or whatever it may be. Even if they have the best things to say. You could have a corrupt politician give the most convincing speech, but people won't, don't want to hear it because he has no credibility. That could happen. Rasulullah has the highest credibility and there's absolutely nothing wrong with the speech of Allah. This is the best of the best. So when he's giving the message of Islam to his audience, there's really no rational reason left for people to walk away. There's no excuse left for people to say, well, what does he know? Or I wasn't, I wasn't that moved by the message. As a matter of fact, when the Quraysh, the most aggressive enemies of Islam, the most aggressive opponents of Islam are describing the Quran as sihrun yu'thar. Uh, magic whose impact is left behind. The fact that they called it magic already tells you that they don't think this is something casual. They recognize this is something supernatural. This is something incredible that cannot be dismissed by some logical argument. So th even they in their dismissal have to call it magic. That's actually an insult to the Prophet ﷺ, but understand that in that insult there's also a compliment. They recognize is highlighting one particular dimension of our personality that we have a hard time changing. He says about this person, he gives a little bit. What that means is he's charitable to an extent. وَأَكْدَى Then he slows down and قَطَعَ مِنْ مِنْ أَعْطِيَتِهِ he, he, he stops giving. This needs some attention. Allah is describing that human beings, even the ones who don't want to listen to anything about Islam, who don't want to hear what the Prophet have to say, they're also charitable people. They also feel like if they, if they were asked to support some worthy cause, they would give too. They're, they're willing to give and support something good. But that goodness, first of all, they can't give too much. Because if they give too much, then there are other things they want to do that they don't want to stop doing. Their, their money is allocated for some other things. Allah put a consciousness inside of us. That consciousness is inside of an atheist. It's inside of a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu. All of them have it. If they see a child suffering, or even an animal suffering, they'll give. 
they'll support. Allah put that humanity inside of us. That's something all human beings share. So they do give. Charitability is there. But in, when it comes to, one way to interpret these ayat is when it comes to other good things, they hold themselves back. So that dimension of our goodness, you figure, well, yeah, you know, I do drink. I do do this, I do the other. Like you, you make a list of all the bad things you do. But then you say, you know, you know, I do help out though. I do support some good causes. And you feel that because you're doing this, it should be able to compensate for all the other bad stuff that you're up to. And when it comes to other good things, he slows down. Others have interpreted this to mean, I'm only going to give, but so much. So much that I don't feel bad anymore. Like, you know, somebody pulled up at a red light and a homeless person stuck their hand out. And you mean, you could stick your hand in your wallet and pull out a, a 20. Or you could look in the cup holder for some quarters. You have a choice. So you go for the quarters. At least I gave something. Right? And you, you, you kept the 20 with you. So he gave to an extent, but then held himself back. But I, I really wanted to highlight the latter interpretation. And that is, you give and you feel that now that you've given, you can slow down the other good things you're doing. This is good enough. I'm a good person. I mean, I give. That should be good enough. And then you appease yourself. You tell yourself a story in which you are or I am a good person. You highlight whatever little you do to yourself and say, you know what, I'm not that bad. I do this, this and this. So what if I, you know, mess up here and there a little bit? It's you see, so you minimize, I minimize my mistakes and I maximize in my mind the good that I do. Right? And it makes me feel good about myself. And so Allah Azza wa then asks this person who thinks this way, and I hope you and I don't become these people, we can. We don't even know, only you know what goes on in your head. Only I know what goes on in my head. Allah asks this person a personal question. Does he possess knowledge of the unseen that he can himself see? A really strange question. A person gives a little bit, feels good about themselves, withholds themselves from doing other good deeds, and Allah asks them the question, do you see the unseen? Have you seen it for yourself? Why would he ask him that question? What does that question have to do with his behavior? You see, when you decide that these good deeds are good enough for Allah, or that bad stuff is not that bad, you're speaking on behalf of Allah. You and I are speaking on behalf of how Allah is going to judge. Oh, Allah and I, we have a special relationship, He gets me. He'll understand. Really? He, he told you this, that He'll understand? You got some special communication from Him, from the unseen, that you can see for yourself what your deeds are worth, and what your bad deeds aren't that bad? Like, you know this for a fact? Or did you tell yourself that story? Allah is actually asking a very bold question because you and I become very bold. We start assuming we can speak on behalf of how Allah will judge us. How Allah will pass judgment on us. You know, there are two extremes, and I want you to be aware of both of these extremes. They're, they're both very lethal. Islam is about, the Quran especially, is about balance. It's right in the middle. One extreme is someone says, man, you know what, I'm going to hell. I know, nothing I do is good enough. My salah, I look around all the time and like, I don't even know if that was wudu or what. I often don't remember if it's the second rakah or the fourth rakah. My head is everywhere else. I, I don't even know what prayer I just did. I don't, and sometimes I don't even pray. I just sleep right through it. So I, I'm pretty much, I know I'm going to hell. I'm a bad person. What can I do? I wish I was better, but I'm not. You become hopeless and you assume that Allah will throw you into hell. This, if you are like this, then you've also made a judgment on behalf of Allah. You decide who goes to hell or Allah does. You, you decided to seal your own fate. You pass judgment on yourself. Why is Allah the judge then? Where did you get the guarantee where you're going? Where did you get the guarantee that your prayers didn't count or they're not good enough? Or you're not the one who grades them. You're not the one who evaluates them. Often people tell you these things. Your prayer is worthless. You know, you're not good enough. You're this or that or the other. And you assume people's judgment of you is the same as Allah's judgment of you. 